welcome back to the show. So I am here. I have got my mango kombucha, like the tried and true basic bitch I am. And today I want to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. We're talking about women's hormones today. Now I'm referring to this loosely, so I'm understood, but I want to be clear that this is for any human who menstruates or anybody who's ever cared about anybody that menstruates. I sincerely hope you fall into one of those categories, but if not, you know, click on over to Joe Rogan, you basic ass dude. We don't need you here. (laughs) I want to touch on fat loss, how your cycle affects your health goals, how to work with it, and I want to briefly touch on birth control and PCOS as well. This is simplified as much as I possibly could. There are a million what ifs and if this then that's and all of that. And that's important, but I think it's more important that we get the conversation going and just sort of imagine that everything I say in this podcast has generally, right before I say it, generally, this is how it goes. Generally, this is what we see. This is not meant to be medical advice. This is not meant to make you nervous. This is not meant to do anything besides inform you and give you a little bit more of a basis to go off of. So let's start with the crowd favorite that is fat loss. A calorie deficit is how fat loss occurs, burning more than you take in. However, there's a lot of things at play here. We're not in a vacuum, we're humans, and a lot of things go into how many calories we are burning and how many calories we are motivated to take in and how that all chemically happens. I have firsthand experience dating a dude who literally has over 100 pounds on me. And let me tell you something, that shit can be infuriating if you try to do any sort of fat loss together. I eat a carefully curated and calculated amount of protein, carbs, fats, and fiber. I drink my water. I make sure my vegetables are, you know, not the dirty dozen. They're organic if they are. They're blah, blah, blah. They're this and that. This dude over here is cutting out second dessert and looks like a Greek god. I'm over it just as much as you are, okay? But here's the deal. Women are generally smaller than men. We generally have less muscle mass than men. And we will therefore generally not burn nearly as many calories per day. Fat loss has to be a little bit more dialed in for us. And this is just one of the many reasons why. But please know that if you are dieting with your boyfriend and he is just rip roaring through pounds on the scale and you are just, you're not seeing the same results, please know that it probably has nothing to do with your efforts and compare yourself to someone else or better yet, don't compare yourself to anybody at all. But I do understand that it can be challenging. So let's start there and let's talk about women burning fat as a theory in general. I want you to take this entire podcast and look at it through the lens of evolution. So in a sense of survival, evolution, and the, you know, the caveman-esque existence, Women have a singular job. (laughs) We are, according to our body, only existing to ensure the survival of the species. In other words, if we can't make babies, body throws a tantrum. Men are, in a general sense, always going to adapt to more stressful exercise, dieting methods, lifestyle habits. They can get away with having shitty sleep and all of these other things. We're going to dive into this more and really talk about how you can apply this, but just know that yes, When our body is kind of carrying out these certain functions, it is based off of needing to survive a pregnancy. For the next 20 minutes, you are a baby making machine and you know your high powered CEO job that you stepped on the patriarchy to get is on the back burner. Seriously, proud of you, boo. You're amazing. But also we have to think this way for a hot second just to understand why our body is constantly losing its shit over little things. So women are four different physiologies throughout the month. We're a different makeup every single week. There are two big phases that these four weeks fall into. The follicular phase is lasting about two weeks from the start of your period. And then the luteal phase lasts from ovulation, which is the middle until your next period. So at ovulation in the middle of your period is when you're the most fertile. Just before this, we're gonna see a spike of testosterone. We will typically perform best in the gym during this time. We will also perform best trying to get other humans into the bedroom and evolution can be very motivating and you're fertile as hell, go for it. (laughs) With that, when we're actually on our period, there are a lot of studies suggesting that we may perform better in endurance settings than when we're not, which is really cool. 
And at the end of your cycle, right before your period, you're at a higher chance of injury and we'll see sometimes up to a 40% decrease in strength output. And that's only observed in some women, but you can range. So you can have a little bit less than that. You may not see any decrease at all. In the entire kind of second two weeks, you are likely gonna be a little bit less coordinated, have that lesser strength output. High skill or high intensity may leave you kind of feeling not so good. <laughs> Don't just write it off though. Use that time to work on shit that does not fall into that category. We can figure this out and train in a way that doesn't make us feel like shit without completely missing out. I know it's so fun. <laughs> uh, who doesn't love memorizing their different gym personalities and matching it to the calendar? At the end of the day, two things are important here. So you have to know your cycle. You should know where you are in your cycle, but you should also know what tends to happen around that time. It's a lot less annoying to lift less weight if you know that it's coming. And secondly, with that, you want to use that information. I know damn well I could eat the whole house 10 days out for my cycle, like clockwork. I have to be prepared to give in a little within reason so I don't accidentally eat my boyfriend if he's on my path to the chocolate because I am on a rampage, but I know it. I know it's coming. You can't compare yourself week to week in progress measures, in scale weight, in anything. Comparing yourself week to week is not only driven by short-term data, which is going to give you more fluctuation and the less kind of trending overall picture anyway. However, if you compare yourself week one of this cycle to week one of your next cycle, you're going to get a lot more accurate depiction of what is going on with your progress markers than if you compare week to week and you're someone that does fluctuate quite a bit. The bottom line, you have to be in a calorie deficit for fat loss. But also, there are a few ways that we can make this a little less violent for those around us when we're doing this with consideration for our cycle. So some women, a lot of women, will do totally fine. Just normal fat loss phase, you're sort of at the same amount of calories throughout, especially week to week. Unless you plateau, then the numbers get changed, so on and so forth. However, some women will not do well this way. They won't do so well doing, you know, an actual caloric deficit all four weeks of the month. If your period is highly symptomatic and your intake and appetite are really affected, in the last two weeks of your period, you'll see women burning an extra 100 to 300 calories more per day to fuel your cycle. But if you're feeling these symptoms, women are recorded as consuming closer to 500 calories more per day during this phase. So... A lot of people will take this as, oh, well, I'm already burning more calories. This is a great time to start my diet. It's like doubling down. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way because we are so motivated to get in that extra food. Maybe it will for the first month and you're extra motivated, all that stuff. That's amazing. I'm just talking for those that it is an overwhelming feeling. Personally, I'll have some of my clients add, you know, three or 400 calories more during this phase if they're sincerely struggling with it. And they will still lose more weight than if they did not add these three or 400 calories. And I'm going to tell you why. This is a compromise. If I tell them that they can eat three or 400 calories more of whatever they want, rather than telling them they have to stick to their diet, they are probably going to stick pretty close to that extra three or 400 calories. If they don't, and they try to really restrict and try to go just as if nothing's going on, and then they go off the deep end, they have an extra thousand calories not only are you know they eating more calories than if we had just given them a little bit extra, but it's also the feeling that you failed. That's horrible. It's not really fair to set yourself up to feel that way. So if we can just give a little bit, sometimes that can really add up in the end. Another great strategy is dieting in the first two weeks and then going into maintenance the second two weeks. So this is very similar in a sense, except for it's not just the week before, it's the whole second half of the month. It's referred to as matador dieting. I believe this is one of their protocols. And basically you're just two weeks in a fat loss phase, two weeks at maintenance. And this has also been shown to keep your maintenance level higher, which is really, really cool. It gets rid of a little bit of that metabolic adaptation at the same time, which is always a good thing. Again, this is just giving yourself a little bit of leeway and it ends up being better than the alternative overall. So we are in the business of manipulating our lives to work to our advantage, not letting our period boss us around. Keep in mind, it's evolution brain here, 
But we also, we can outsmart it in a few ways. And we can sort of use it to our advantage if we know what's going on and we know what to expect. So in evolution brain land, keep in mind the body needs about 50,000 extra calories to survive a pregnancy. This is sort of an old number, and there's a lot of research out saying that it is likely much more than this. However, this was the last concrete thing I found, so this is what I'm saying. Even if this is, you know, on the low end, 50,000 extra calories, if our body feels like it's unable to support that, or it's unable to get those extra calories, it is not going to grant us a menstrual cycle where we are ovulating and things are wonderful. It's going to throw a goddamn tantrum because that's what it's supposed to do. Your body doesn't know that you're dieting. It just sees a lack of food availability. So in our body's eyes, we're only meant to carry children. So if we are in a famine, of course we're not going to get pregnant. We're not going to survive that pregnancy. We have to let our body know that there is food available and that we are safe and all of those things. You can also still have a period and not ovulate. So you don't need to completely lose your period for your body to feel unsafe. And this should not be some sort of measure of whether or not we're eating too little or training too much. It's not your get out of jail free card of, oh, well, I still have my period, so it's fine. There are some severely underfed women still having a period, but it's more than likely full of horrendous symptoms and it's probably really unpredictable and you don't want to kind of live that way. You want your body to feel safe and happy because then it works with you. Remember this, your period is your monthly report card. I did not coin this term. I don't know who originally coined this term, but I love it. I think it's amazing. If your period is the worst thing ever, something is off. It is not to say that something is off and it's your fault or you're doing something wrong. It is to say that something is off. If your period is just ending your shit every single month or is missing altogether, there are some decent places to start as far as testing goes. So every woman has their normal cycle, but generally it should be about 28 to 35 days, about three to seven days in length. It shouldn't be massively out of that range. And if it is, if you're feeling a ton of symptoms, Check your thyroid, get your sex hormones tested. You should definitely not be dealing with a doctor that won't order the tests for you if you are worried or have any issues going on. Testosterone and thyroid hormones are gonna be big players in your cycle, so you can ask for those specifically. Testing, you know, prolactin, follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, luteal hormones, not a bad idea either. The more complete of a panel you can get, the better. You should ensure that you're not dealing with some sort of insulin resistance problem that can really screw with things. And even looking into some gut health reassurance is not a bad idea either. SIBO and, you know, things like that can really throw our whole body for a loop. Get testing done. Yell at your doctor. Again, play my annoying ass voice in their peaceful office and I promise you they'll order the test just to get you to go away. (laughs) So then we move on to the lifestyle factors. So make sure you're not sleeping like shit. Don't eat out of plastic whenever you can. Use makeup that isn't spelled wrong on the label. You know, just like kind of get it together a little bit. Lifestyle factors are so massively underrated in helping to ease symptoms. And if you just put an ounce of effort in, a lot of times for most women, that can be all it takes. Some women, yeah, you're going to have a pain in the ass time and you're going to have to be near perfect with these things. And that sucks. But for a lot of us, it doesn't take too, too much effort. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go listen to the basics episode, fix those things, and have a happy shark week. With that, there are some amazing resources that I will list in the show notes that I really recommend as well. So, okay, you're bored, I'm bored, we're going to move on. I want to briefly, briefly touch on PCOS, and I want to be abundantly clear that I am not a doctor. I am not diagnosing your ass with anything. I want this to be put out there so if it sounds familiar, you can go to your doctor and you can bother them and they'll order your blood work for you because you have something to present to them. Fat loss with PCOS is not only different, but it's much more challenging. PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can reduce your BMR a lot. So your BMR is your basal metabolic rate, and those are how many calories you burn to exist just to keep your body kicking, not die. It can reduce your BMR by up to 40%. That is a lot of calories that you are not burning through. And this is going to make fat loss significantly harder. If you are burning up to 40% less calories, your calories in versus calories out are going to look a lot different from someone who is not dealing with this. About one in five women can experience PCOS. And many of those women will see insulin resistance. That's a really big part of this. So a lower carbohydrate and GI diet, 
just trying to reduce fat mass overall, solid exercise regimen, it, they're all great to manage symptoms. However, it's not something that's easy to manage, and I don't want to say this lightly because I feel like it's just thrown around. To, oh, you have to lose weight and exercise and eat healthier, and that's just not doing anybody any good. PCOS can also not just be diagnosed by an ultrasound alone. You should be asking for further testing if your diagnosis is solely riding on an ultrasound. So typically, we want to see at least two out of the following to be diagnosed formally. So we would have to see increased androgens, actual cysts on your ovaries, which can be seen by the ultrasound, or a massively disrupted menstrual cycle. Those are going to be kind of the big ones. PCOS or other hormonal issues, they're, they're not a death sentence. Hashimoto's, PCOS, other conditions, they may mean you need to take a little bit more comprehensive approaches to your health, your fat loss, your exercise. But it's absolute bullshit that you are destined to be overweight or feel like garbage all the time. I don't like that that's sort of the narrative we've gone with in Western medicine. There are plenty of people that deal with these conditions, that live healthy lives, that are athletes, that are all of these things. It just takes a little bit more effort, which sucks, but so life goes. That's my spiel on PCOS. I want to touch on birth control and then I promise I will leave your ass alone. Overall, birth control is something that is prescribed for a few reasons. Number one, you don't want to have a baby. Wonderful. Number two, you present pretty much any symptom of puberty, of being a woman, of anything like that, and your doctor hands it to you. If you are informed and you are using birth control knowing everything and just you really made an informed decision and you decided this is what I want, amazing. Get it, girl. I am 100% behind that. I never want anybody to think that I'm anti-birth control because I'm absolutely not anti-birth control. What I am anti is the lack of education surrounding it. So a highly symptomatic period, like we said, is indicative that something else is off. Band-aiding the symptoms at 14 years old and never dealing with things again <laughs> until we want to get off of the pill is not a great strategy. And this again changes. If we've really gone through things and decided that weighing birth control as an option is the way to go, amazing we still need to manage certain things. For me, it was 100% worth it to not throw up from pain every month, nor have a child at 16. Weighing birth control versus trusting a teenage boy was a pretty easy decision on my part. Now, it's not as worth it to me. So I transitioned off and I deal with it. I deal with the things that have come back as a result of not being on it. It's give and take. So I was put on birth control at a pretty young age. Again, horrible cramps. And my mom is like cool as fuck. And she didn't like ban me from it and say like you're never having sex and all of that she was super cool so I'm sure she asked questions and I'm sure she had a much better handle on what going on the pill meant than I did however I didn't know anything and I was incredibly lucky my mom is awesome she would go to bat for me no matter what and ask any questions for me that I ever had but not everybody has my mom which makes me really sad because if you are just a young girl and you don't have someone like that that's in your corner that is going to ask the question and is going to be a little bit more confrontational and get more information, you're just sort of taking it blindly. That's not really fair. I think it's irresponsible that doctors will just sort of throw birth control at really young girls without letting them know that this is a major decision. I was on it for a decade and I only really learned about it in the last two years I was on it. That's crazy. The biggest thing was I was not aware that I was not dealing with organic hormones. So when I was trying to fix my hormonal health, I didn't realize that I was dealing with synthetic versions. They're not the same. Like you don't have a period on birth control. You have a withdrawal bleed. You cannot approach your hormonal health the same way as if you were not on hormonal birth control. And that's okay if you know that. If you're informed, making the decision for yourself and only yourself, I'm good here. I have no qualms and I think it's an amazing thing that we have it. How cool that we have birth control available to almost anybody. But making those educated decisions is extremely important. And I really, really believe that. I really, really in my heart of hearts believe that. I have a feeling that I will probably do a specific birth control episode in the future, but for now, if you know somebody that could use this podcast, please share it with them. If you know somebody that maybe is dealing with something like this, tell them, let them know. I appreciate you more than you know for listening to this crazy, crazy episode. I tried to pack a lot of different things into this. So 
If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. I have like a million different medias. Go in the show notes, whatever you need to do. I'm more than happy to talk to you about this. I love you all. I will see you next time. Bye, guys. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.